Hi. Um, I'm going to sort of try and ramble through my massive research obsession and hope to drag you along with me. Um, before I was a lecturer, before I was a researcher, I was a speech pathologist at the Canberra MND clinic. Oh, way, way, way back there, back in, I finished there 2012. I went on to do a PhD. I'm just going to whip through these because there's a lot to talk about and not enough time to do it all in. So that was the PhD study there. And that's the model that was developed from it. So if any of you have, have delved into the literature on decision making tools, I'm hoping you found that one because to me that's the most important bit out there. I did, did I? Sorry, I'm bashing away at the keys here. <laughs> sorry, yeah, I did. Oh, wow. Okay, so we had this model that was. De uh, sorry, I'm going to make you all seasick with this. So <laughs> a model that was that we we thought was good, but we needed to make it useful. There's no point in a theoretical model unless you can translate it into clinical care. So the rest of my research life has been about trying to do that in some way, shape, or form. So I wanted to have something that was useful to people with MND to make decisions for their care because as both Anna and Lynn have, have put out there, there's a lot of decisions to be made, a lot of them are time constrained and they're all incredibly difficult things to do in very, very difficult circumstances, especially as you get towards the end of life as Lynn has, has um, pointed out to us. Um, so I wanted to be able to promote discussions between patients, carers and their clinicians to do as a group within either the, you know, the, the multidisciplinary clinic setting, but obviously not everybody has access to that no matter where you're living, it's, it's, it's a difficult one. So there was a basis for discussion that people were as much as possible on the same page in their thinking and where they think they want to head with their decisions, whether they choose an option or decline an option, as long as they're informed to do so. Um, and so, yeah, the, the framework for clinical discussions for there. So um, this is kind of documented in this 2015 report from MND uh, Australia. Yes, that's mm -hmm. theirs, isn't it? Yes. Sorry, I get all the different associations muddled. Um, and we published a protocol document which was, ended up being quite important to do so because these protocol documents are the way the, West, the rest of the world finds your research. And a lot of research has developed um, from this in other countries and in Australia as well. So basically the, the timeline uh, looks something like this and essentially if you look at the first dot that's where the money was but all the work actually happened after the money ran out. So <laughs> this is why it's taking so long. It's a great labour of love. I have dragged so many people along with me to do this and it's all been done on a voluntary basis and I'm so grateful to everybody who's chipped in with their thoughts, opinions, comments on this website. It's, it's an unfinished work, a work in progress if you like, but um, we will get there eventually. I just don't know when eventually will be. Um, okay, so how many of you have seen the tool website? I know it's been well distributed through, can you just give me a, or a few of you, okay, because I didn't know how much time to spend yabbering on about the tools. If you've already seen them, I didn't want to go too far with that. Okay, so what we've got currently, of the six tools planned, because I was very enthusiastic and very naive, we have three that are, in, uh, are completed as such. So we have a gastrostomy tool for PEG, that's been done in collaboration with the lovely speech pathology and gastro team from St Joseph's in Auburn here. Um, they then did a, a PEG project which allowed us to review the tool which was terrific. Uh, we developed a predictive genetic testing project, uh, tool with um, Ashley Crook from the Macquarie Neurology. And that's, that's been a wonderful help to us. She's been a really great support. And then we went to develop the NIV tool and that's just been done with the team at Westmead. So Peter Wu and his team. Um, but this is the only tool that hasn't had any patient input. We haven't um, been able to get funding to try it out with patients to see what they actually think about and carers. So it's just been reviewed by clinicians and a little bit of feedback on the tool website itself. So a few challenges along the way to developing it. Um, as anybody who sort of steps outside and tries to, to make something and put it in the public domain will know. So it's just about using a lot of different people, consulting, not enough funding to do it in a cohesive and coherent way. Um, but neither am I cohesive or coherent. I'm a little bit chaotic. I really admire Anna's way of doing it and it looks logical and it's finished and or to a stage where you're happy with it and I'm very, very um, impressed. So we had a lot of uh, things that helped. A lot of good communication with a lot of different workarounds and so projects that have stemmed from it. So we've got the uh, 
PEG decision making project that was conducted at St Joseph's that still was still in publication with that. Um, we were then contacted by a researcher at Southampton University in the UK and she and her team and with me on the team are developing a PEG decision tool for patients in the UK because the tools I've developed are very very specific to Australia and they call on Australian resources. Um, Anna are you okay if I put a link to your project on, on my homepage please because I've that's really, really needed as an introductory thing, so people, yeah. Um, and then uh, there's the Amsterdam Clinic, so Leonard Vandenberg's clinic, they're developing um, a decision tool, but just again for gastrostomy as part of a PhD project there. And in Sheffield with um, Christopher McDermott's group, the, the ProGas group, if you've come across their work, um, they're developing a gastrostomy tool again. Okay, so everybody else has been sensible and just stuck to gastrostomy. I've gone, and if you have a look at the website, the, we've seen the three completed tools of gastrostomy, genetic testing and NIV. The planned tools are communication equipment, uh -huh. um, advanced care directives and choice of place of end of life care. So whether you're looking at home versus palliative care, that kind of thing, just laying out the options, the benefits and challenges to both of those choices. Um, with the passing of assisted dying laws in Victoria, I mean the thought is that eventually they may spread through, be gained in the other states too. So we're debating whether to put um, a tool about assisted dying decision making on the website as well. When I first floated that with um, the patients and carers in the initial project in developing what tools would go on this site, they, that wasn't a popular one. They didn't think that was one of the most essential choices. So we've just developed the tools, the six tools that they thought were most important. But I'm now sort of wondering, with the law change, will that be something that people will want to consider? So I'm very, very open to suggestion on that one. Is this all making sense? Thank goodness. Okay. If you want to have a look at the tool on your smartphone, though, sorry, my, I'm on Vodafone. I couldn't get signal in here, so I couldn't look at Anna's, but I have seen it before. That's where it lives. So if you want to have a brief look at it while I'm rabbiting on, that would be great. But I can show you some slides if you can't get hold of it. Um, oh, all right, I might... So I'll just talk about what's at the back end of it, the data we collect. We sort of talk, uh, find about how many visitors have come to the site, how many are new, how many have recurred, um, and location by country. So there's no identity, it's all very, very um, confidential and private. We look at how often they visit, um, the sites most visited, the duration and how much time they spend on each page. And we look at the tool use information, so their responses to the tool survey sections. So basically, each tool has an information section. It then has a grid about the choice. So each tool really only answers one question. So the gastrostomy tool, for example, is should I have gastrostomy for my nutrition and hydration in MND? That's all we're trying to answer. So the second page of this tool has the, um, the pros and cons, if you like, the benefits and challenges to doing that. Um, so, oops, I might actually, I'll come back to that back end data. We'll have a look at the tool pages. Uh, so that's the home page. This is the information page, a sample from that. So you can see we lay out the information and then all the sections of information are in drop down. So that people have said to us sometimes the information is overwhelming. We just want to read as we go and what we feel comfortable with. So we've kept it in bars and people can look and drop down about what they want to read at any given point in time. If they want to come back to it and read more, that's terrific. So once they've done this reading, they come to the, the question, and this is what I was talking about, the uh, benefits and challenges or the pros and cons. So this is the essential information if you decide to go ahead with gastrostomy. What are the, the consequences? What are, the, what are you up for, basically? And then if you decide not to, what might be the, the problems that you encounter or what are the benefits that you may encounter from not going ahead with that, that decision. After they've done that, we ask them to rate what's most important to them. What are your reasons to have gastrostomy and what are your reasons not to have gastrostomy? And so we ask them just to indicate what's most important at that point in time to them. We then ask them to talk about, or to tell us about their feelings. How are you feeling? Are you, do you think this is enough information? Do you, do you want to proceed with this? Are you still unsure? Do you need more information? <coughs> uh, 
and what are your thoughts at this point? So we just put through a little bit of a fact check just to see um, that they've actually read the information. So this format, I, I didn't come up with this. This is an internationally approved from the in, uh, international decision, decision make, shared decision making collaboration that comes out of Ottawa Hospital in Canada. This is all based on their research, so it's a, a prescribed format. Um, and the tools are, will be registered on their website so that, to say that they prescribe with international criteria, if you like. So they're not, they're not too random or haphazard. And then we ask them, what do you want to do? Do you want to go ahead with it? And then if they do, then go back, go back to your health professionals, find out what, what's available to you in your local area. If you don't, if you want more reading, we've got reading on the next page. If you're unsure, there's more reading. And if you don't want to go ahead with it, then talk to your health professionals. So that's a, a very standard format that we've put in. So we just put in some references to let them know where more information is available and the acknowledgements for the tool. So that's roughly what the tool is looking like. And there's uh, a feedback page at the end of it, so they, people can back, get back to us about that. So hang on, I'm just going to go backwards. How am I doing for time, Marie? Yeah, right? OK. Some of the feedback we've gotten so far. OK, so is that easy to see? That's roughly where people have contacted us from in the world. So you can see oh, the Sheffield group that we're, we're linked to good. We've got some colleagues in Germany who also have looked at PEG decision making but decided against going ahead to develop a tool. I think they saw how tricky it was going to be and how expensive it was going to be, so they, uh, they pulled back on that one. Um, but most of, it's, most of it's come from Sydney. Sorry. Oh, OK. Is that better? You're moving away. Oh, sorry. Yes. <laughs> Great for a speech pathologist who talks way too fast and can't use a microphone. You can see why I went into research. <laughs> All right. And so this one shows us a bit about um, the new visitors versus returning visitors. So in the, the pie, pie chart, we've got the, the most of them were new visitors, less returning. In the, the graph across the top, there's a big spike in April, I think that's when MND Australia um, promoted the tool, so people have had a chance to look at it and, and see what's in there. Um, and then the graph at the bottom just tells us roughly where people have come from to look at it, so I can't read this because I haven't got my glasses on, which is why I keep turning my head. <laughs> uh, yes, Sydney was a big hitter. Um, and this is just the data in the last six months. We actually launched this at the Glasgow MND uh, ALS Symposium last year. So that's when the, we started the data collection to get the feedback on the tools so that we can make the tools better. We think they're okay, but we know they need a bit of work. So that's why we're desperate for people's feedback. And so we've got a fair bit to go with, um, which will be done in the next iteration of the tools. Not, not just yet. Okay, so the tool that was completed most was the gastrostomy tool out of the three. So that tells us that a lot of people are thinking about PEG or wanting to know more about PEG, which was good. And this, okay. Oh, sorry. And the genetic testing tool was the most highly rated, which is interesting because Ashley's decided it needs a complete overhaul. <laughs> So we'll see how that one ends up. But that's good. So some of the feedback we've received, so in the top corner there, um, from a patient who said it's, it's very difficult to use it if, you, if you're using a tracking device. Now, I need somebody who's an expert in AAC to work with me on that to see what we can do to make that work. Um, so if anybody's interested, email me, please. Um, and then just some general feedback on the tool itself to see how it was helpful or not. Yes, it was helpful. Um, again, we've only asked yes, no questions. So we're really relying on people to put into that feedback box to tell us what was good, not yes or no. And they thought the six areas were the most relevant, which is, which is reassuring. Yep. OK. So a lot of rating systems. OK. so. Basically, in summary, I think for me, um, it's staying focused on the end goal. This is one of the first bits of feedback I got from a, a, a patient we'd worked with through the Prince of Wales Clinic. And she said to me that the decision tool gives her context for saying no. 
She thought about it and she decided against it. She still decided against it. Um, she's very happy with that decision. And, and it helps her just think about why. So if anybody asks, well, why aren't you getting a gastrostomy? And she can say, well, for these reasons. So I was thrilled with that. So the plan is basically to update the website and keep it current from the feedback we've received to complete the remaining tools. Now, this is where I make a pitch for a PhD student, anyone, anyone who's interested in going to research. I need somebody who's a, as nutty as I am about this and has far more technical skills than I do. We have an IT company doing the website stuff, but um, they're offshore and need regular corrections on their English grammar. <laughs> <laughs> and the next thing is, is how do we develop a process to make this useful. So it's very ad hoc. People stumble across it, they're directed to it, but it's not used routinely as part of clinics. How do we make sure that this is useful in the clinical settings? And that's a whole other step. So it may even be a whole other PhD. So two? Okay. That would be great. Okay. And I'll leave it there, I think. Any questions? Anything I can do? Well, I came across a patient and... Um I think so. Yeah. So I came across a patient and basically it was too late for him. Yeah. So what do you think should be the time frame? Ah, the time frame's a tricky one. Clinically for us, the time frame is the, the second or third conversation after the diagnosis conversation. Very, very, very early. However, Patients aren't ready to hear that. Most patients aren't ready to hear that then. Uh, I know we allow, like to allow people six months, sort of, uh, sort of the grief process, that sort of thing, and then start introducing with the, with the decisions. But it's very variable because people may go into denial for quite some period of time, as we know, whether others will just want to get in there and make their decisions very, very quickly. So it's just about what the patient is able to do for them and when they're able to talk about it. And it's just about us being ready to make that conversation with them when we think they are ready. And so I guess it's just each time we see them. Are you seeing people every three months still follow up in between? Everybody's a little bit different. Yeah, it's about pitching those questions to them. Are you ready? Is this going to is something you want to talk about now? And then, you know, talking with the family as well. So it's, it's a whole group of people working on this together. Does that help? It, there's no definite answer to that one. It's a doozy. Yeah. We might keep moving on. Yes, please. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, so thank you all. Um, any questions, just email them.